All right. With that being said, let's get this started. I would like to welcome everyone to the March 21st meeting of the Community Resources Committee. I am Garrick Perry, the chair of the committee. And first off, I want to inform everyone that this meeting is being video and audio recorded. Uh, with that being said, Laura, if you would take the roll call. Sure. Councillor Perry. Here. Okay. Um, Councillor Elkins is not present. Councillor Jarrett. Here. And Councillor Maori. Here. Perfect. Now we are in the business. Our <laughs> next agenda item is updates and announcements from committee members. So if anyone has an update, now is the time. No one. Well, I have a, a quick one just to note that uh, I had a pleasure attending the Holyoke St. Patrick's Day Parade yesterday with the mayor and our vice chair of this committee, Marissa Elkins, as well as a couple other counselors. Um, and for all the counselors who weren't able to make it in person, I know they were there in spirit and it was a lovely day. Uh, the, the spring weather really got people out and it makes me very excited for more community activities down the road. So that is my announcement. Um, oh, look, our, our president, of the city council, Jim Nash was also there and still has his wares. Uh, with that being said, that moves us to public comment. And if you wish to make a public comment, we ask that you use, ra use the raise hand function. Uh, that's in the bottom menu under reactions, or if you're on your phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. Do you have any public comment? I don't see any. Barbara Devlin would like to yeah. speak. I think this is where I. Yeah. Not, no, not where yet. Am I? Okay. You're you're actually right after this. All uh, right. All right. So but, cancel that. <laughs> but I do have a comment from Councilor Labarge. Oh, we have to let her unmute herself. Sorry about that. I want to thank um, all the counselors who attended the St. Pat's Parade. You all looked awesome, and the mayor looked awesome, and especially our council president. I thought he looked awesome with the green wreath around his head. But secondly, very important to me, being a member of the Rotary Club for such a long time, of having a great, great member Barbara Devlin being here today to speak. So thank you for allowing that. Thank you, Councilor Labarge. Any other public comment? Seeing none, then we can move on to the fifth item on our agenda, which is um, <coughs> off with Barbara, Dev Barbara Devlin, who's here from Northampton's Rotary Club. So now the floor is yours, Barbara. Thank you very much for um, being able to fit me into your agenda this evening. Um, what I wanted to do is to tell you a little bit about a Rotary Day of Service that is coming up on April 16th. Um, for those of you who may not know what Rotary is, uh, it's an international organization. It's, uh, there are over 35,000 clubs across the globe uh, over 1.4 million members. And regardless of where Rotary Clubs are, are located, their basic uh, purpose is to serve their community, to help make the world a better place. So our international president, uh, Sheikh Armekta, has challenged every Rotary Club across the globe to conduct a day of service in their community. And the Rotary Clubs of Connecticut and Western Massachusetts decided to do our day of service during the month of April. You may have seen some uh, previous correspondence that referenced uh, April 9th, but as we determined the, uh, the sites for our project, we decided that April 16th was the best for us. So what's happening on April 16th is uh, in keeping with Rotary International's, uh, one of their new areas of focus on uh, 
protecting the environment, we decided we wanted to do a tree planting project. So we've been working with the city of Northampton, uh, the Urban Forestry Commission and Tree Northampton to organize this. And uh, we're very excited that we'll be planting trees at two elementary schools, Jackson Street School and um, uh, RK Finn Ryan Road School. Uh, so, and our goal is to plant 15 trees at each site on that day. There are actually more trees that will be planted in the future at those sites, but that's what we feel we can accomplish on that day. We've been working with uh, I mentioned one of our key contacts is uh, Rich uh, Parcelletti, who is the tree warden, and um, also Sue Lofthouse, who's the vice chair of the Urban Forestry Commission. So um, they've been very helpful. Uh, our responsibility as Rotary is to line up volunteers for that day, and they'll be working, the volunteers will be working in teams of two. They'll choose one of the two sites, uh, whatever site they prefer. Um, and anyone interested in volunteering can just contact me at my email and my email is listed in uh, one of the documents. You should have received two documents. Uh, one of them is kind of an overview. So it has my email there. Um, I'm happy to say that Marianne Labarge, who is a Rotarian, she also represents Ward 6, which has Ryan Road School in it. Um, is going to be one of the volunteers on that day. And we would love to have um, any other val volunteers who are interested uh, from the city council. Um, in addition to seeking volunteers for that day, um, our club is also inviting contributions uh, toward the purchase of trees for future projects. We're inviting contributions to our uh, Northampton Rotary Foundation Inc. and the address is there. And all of the dollars that are received will be used to, uh, will be working with Rich Parcelletti to purchase trees or compost or other kinds of uh, supplies that they need for, for future tree projects. And then we also are trying to spread the word about the uh, uh, setback tree planting program available through the city. So we're tr really trying to be a partner with the city on this to um, uh, promote uh, uh, lots of tree planting within the city of Northampton. So that's basically the information I have. Um, we This has been wonderful for me as an opportunity to meet people in Northampton where my husband and I are uh, fairly new to the area. We moved out here from Minnesota to be closer to our daughter and uh, her family who are Northampton residents. So uh, this has been a fun project to work on. Thank you. Do any of the counselors have any questions or? Councilor Maori. I just really wanted to thank Barbara. Um, that's that's a great use of a day of service. And it's, it's such an uplifting uh, activity. I've been a volunteer for Tree Northampton for a while. I'm happy to volunteer that day and also share the event on my listserv. So thanks a lot, Barbara. Yeah, and be sure to tell me if you do want to volunteer because uh, uh, we want to get your, the, the Rotary District wants to know everybody who's volunteering. And so I want to make sure I get people listed. Uh, with with them and uh, you'll get a t-shirt a day of service t-shirt so <laughs> Councilor Jared yeah Barbara I would like to thank you as well for for really thinking of, of such a forward thinking uh, activity um, tree planting is something that you know we've planted so many trees already in the city and we realize how many more we have to go to be able to catch up with kind of the net tree loss that we've seen uh, over the decades. Um, and we really are starting to catch up with that loss. And so, so um, I really appreciate it. And I will be sure to share this with my constituents as well. Great, thank you, thank you. And I too want to mirror the other counselors in thanking you, Barbara, for coming to speak with us and also thank Councilor Labarge for bringing this to my attention and asking if we could discuss this here. 
Um, we also had the pleasure recently of meeting the award-winning tree warden, uh, Rich Barcelletti. And I know that with him involved, only excellence can occur. So I am looking forward to seeing this in our city. So thank you. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you. Now with that, uh, sorry, let me just pull up the agenda. Our next item on the agenda is an update from the Department of Community Cares uh, Implementation Director, Sean Donovan. Well, we wanna welcome Sean Donovan here. Hey, John. Council, I appreciate uh, being invited to, to come share, um, you know, what, where we're at in this process. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank you so much for extending the invitation. Um, and yeah, I'll just say, following up from where Barbara left off, uh, April 16th is my birthday. Uh, I might be out of town, so I won't be planting any trees here that day, but uh, I also appreciate uh, the amount of trees we have in this community uh, from Childs Park to Smith College to all around. So mm -hmm. thanks for bringing that. Um, yeah, so I, I wanted, I know that some of some of you had uh, passed some questions to me through through Laura. So thank you so much for relaying those. Um, so I've, I've made sure to try and respond to um, each of the questions you had, uh, but I wanted to check in uh, with, with those of you um, on the committee to see if um, you'd like me to give a, a brief overview and then maybe have more of a dialogue where you can pose some of the questions to me. Um, I, I guess this is just my personal preference. Like, I don't want to talk at you for like uh, 20 minutes. <laughs> I could probably talk at you for hours, but I know that um, I really want to make sure that what I'm sharing, uh, you know, can be in dialogue with some of what you're, what you're thinking. So I just wanted to check in with Councillor Perry and whoever else could, could just like offer some thoughts about the format. That would be helpful. I, I think, Sean, that is an excellent way to do this, is just have you kind of briefly introduce, and, and really, I just want you to be here to converse with us, so sounds good to me. Awesome. Okay, if that sounds good for everybody else, then that's, that's how I'll do it. Um, I'll just give a brief overview of where we're at, and then um, I know some of you had some specific questions about budget items, about the types of response we would uh, be envisioning, uh, and, and more, so we can get to that. Uh, what I will say, um, you know, I think last week marked my three months uh, role or three months, um, three months of me in this position as implementation director. And it's been a harrowing three months, I think, for our city and for the country, um, by which I mean, uh, you know, to, to be starting not only the establishment of a, of, a, of a new department, which I think is kind of unique <laughs> to the city in, in the span of decades, perhaps, um, but to have a public health adjacent department start in this time has been really challenging. <laughs> a lot of my colleagues in the public health department have been, you know, putting in a lot of long hours to um, address the Omicron outbreak and kind of the residual pieces of that. So some of um, the people that I've wanted to connect with months ago, I've just been able to connect with last week, to be honest, um, not because there wasn't a desire, but because there was a lot going on. Um, and, and that being said, you know, I've been putting, uh, my feet to the ground, walking around, talking to people, having a lot of meetings. And so I want to give just a brief uh, overview of that. Uh, I just want to give the caveat that it's been a tough three months, I think, for all of us in different ways. So um, and certainly it's, it's had an impact on uh, how I can hold my role at this moment. And so very grateful that it seems, you know, with the mask mandate lifted and uh, at least those are some signs that there's movement away from the height of the pandemic. Um, so yeah, a lot of my work has been connecting with stakeholders on a lot of different levels um, since I began in December um, from people in the city uh, that hold our um, you know, public safety and public health teams together, a lot of nonprofits and groups that um, you know, address uh, basic needs in our community, um, address uh, you know, needs of uh, domestic violence and AIDS care and um, provide community meals and drop-in spaces. I've been connecting with um, dozens of groups in that regard. Um, and also just, you know, getting on the street and talking to people, honestly. I think we all know this is a city, especially when it gets warmer, um, where there are a lot of people on the sidewalk, um, whether they're playing music or, or busking for money. Um, we have a really thriving community, and I, I love that about this city. Um, and so there are sometimes I, I meet with people on Zoom or Google Meets, and sometimes I'm like, I know the corner that you're at on Tuesday. <laughs> 
and I can, you know, touch in with people to, um, to have some conversations about how things are going. Um, so my meetings have spanned from, um, you know, like official to, to very um, in passing, you know, on the street. And I've been spending a lot of time at the MANA Community Center. I was just at, uh, there today and went to one of their meetings with the Resilience Hub coordinators. So um, what I'm just trying to detail for you, I don't want to go into too much, uh, you know, digression here, but a lot of what I've been focusing on is trust building. Uh, and making sure that not only am I connected to these groups, but they're connected to each other to some regard to. Um, so something that I, I didn't get to share before this meeting began, and maybe um, I could share it with Laura, if that's the official way to do that. Um, I help with the help of some other people, um, I made a Northampton support and resource guide uh, that I've started sharing with uh, different drop-in centers and businesses and just from City Hall too. Uh, I can share those links with you, uh, which are to PDFs. And, um, that's been a really great project to get to know people and resources as they shift out of COVID, especially um, protocols. Um, but also it's, it's just been a good um, agenda or sort of like, um, you know, curriculum for me to follow, <laughs> to be like, who haven't I spoken to yet? Uh, because all of these resources are low or no barrier resources. And I think they also have a lot of, um, they're part of the fabric of our, what I would call greater community care in our city. And so, um, I'm sorry I didn't share this ahead of time. It's probably you know better to look at it than to for me to describe it, but I can for, forward it your way. Um, this is also open to anyone in the public right now. I've not been we've we've just uh, been figuring out through one of our committees like how we're going to share this widely, but I've been sharing it with people as as they ask. Um, so a lot of my connections are, are also like they're leading to um, starting a, either like an implementation committee or a working group. I haven't decided the name for that but I have a clear idea of who I'd like to be on that group. Um, I'm also looking to have a separate group called the Advisory Council, like a la the um, Northampton Policing Review Commission's recommendation um, to have people with largely lived experience, like offer some continued accountability and feedback, not only to the implementation process, but to the working department. Um, and so those are some things that I've, I've been building relationships with people like on the sidewalk, in drop-in centers, in formal meetings to figure out like who are those people? <laughs> and so I think before we could even form a group, there has to be like um, almost like asset mapping, which is what I've been doing, um, figuring out like who needs to be at that figurative table. Um, and quite honestly, if I'm gonna be really honest, I'm really glad this, the council is taking on um, the issue of looking at structural barriers to council and other participation, because I, I, I am trying to sort through that as as I start to think about people that aren't paid by their um, professional roles to come to these things, like how are we compensating people? And it's a tough, <laughs> it's a tough battle in the city right now. Like not that there isn't desire uh, to want to compensate people, but um, yeah, I'm just glad that the city council is looking at that right now. Um, I'll just I'll just say that much. Um, so part of it is wanting to make sure that when inviting people onto these different groups and committees, there's something they can offer um, feedback to. And I've been working on developing like uh, provisional organizational charts and how we might respond to calls, et cetera, just in a, a draft form. Um, and also how, how can we, you know, if we can, if we can, how can we compensate people for their participation or at least be really clear why we can't right now. Um, so I'm just gonna leave that open-ended <laughs> for now. Um, the other thing I will share is that um, from meetings with our public safety team, public health, and just throughout the community, uh, I've also been connecting with um, already existing community responder programs. I know those of you that were on council last year and part of the Policing Review Commission, like you, you did a fair amount of that too, which is awesome and, and great. So I've been treading some similar grounds with uh, reaching out to CAHOOTS in um, Eugene, Oregon. Um, Crisis Assistance Helping Out on the Streets is what the acronym stands for, um, which has been around for 30 plus years. Uh, I've also made some connections with uh, the group in Olympia, Washington, which is a, a size city that's sim more similar to ours than Eugene and Springfield, uh, Oregon and Olympia, Washington, um, and connecting with their teams that are called the Crisis Response Unit and Familiar Faces, um, which is a part of their response that really tries to pair peer supporters with people that are getting repeatedly um, sort of wrapped up in law enforcement and the hospital system, but not really getting what they need. Um, and so that's something I'd like for us to think about for our community too. 
uh, because I think having a different first responder team is essential, which is what the Police Review Commission has decided, and I, I agree. Um, but also having some people that are out of the first uh, responder rhythm who can connect more deeply with community members that are getting missed, I think is also part of that too. So I'm, I'm envisioning a structure for our department that includes, you know, foremost our community responder team, but also these people that could be um, supporters or navigators that are a little bit different. Um, and the third piece uh, that I wanted to share that I'm thinking about for our initial department um, is one that focuses on community and public education. Uh, I really feel like talking to so many people uh, who have done this already and a lot of people locally that we need a structural change, you know, having another first responder team that's not law enforcement, that's not clinical, um, that has more space for the gray area um, and the calls that we've identified already, mental health, substance use, some minor conflict, et cetera, that don't need an armed response. Um, but we also need culture shift. Um, so I'm really hoping that, you know, initially this could be educational opportunities that mirror the training that we give to our first responders, uh, because I, I want our community to have some sense of um, what kind of practices our responders will be using as they respond. Um, but I think we also need our community to learn some of those skills for themselves. And so while we can't, you know, put community through like multiple 40 hour trainings. <laughs> we just don't have the budget or the space for that. Um, I think we could give some, uh, you know, offer some events perhaps recorded by Northampton Open Media that we could archive that could talk about like, for instance, um, how do you uh, use some harm reduction principles in your life supporting someone who's using drugs in a way that you think is erratic, for instance, or um, how do you support someone that says they're suicidal? Like, how do you lean into that conversation rather than ignore it or, or shut down? Um, and so those are two examples that, you know, we could give some pieces to our greater community um, that would be elements of how we've supported our first responders to, to, to be onboarded in our, in our training. Um, and so these are, these are pieces that I'm hoping uh, other people will, will have some buy-in to as well in the city. Uh, I've gotten some good feedback already. <laughs> um, but it's also something that I would like for more people with lived experiences of these things to have more input around. And so the third piece, which I'll, which I'll share now, or the other piece is just, I'm working on requests for proposals for consultants. Um, I'm gonna be really honest with you. This is the first time I'm writing a request for proposal. So I've needed the support of my colleagues in public health to help me with that. And so while I have some good drafts together, um, they're helping me refine that this week. Um, and into next week probably too, but, but that would be consultants to help us with dispatch data analysis. Um, that would be a really specific um, consultant for that. And then separately for process and implementation when it comes to like hiring, I also want those other consultants to do some community engagement with specific forums. Um, and I can get more into that if you're interested. Uh, but what I found, I did write like an overall request for proposal, just like, something that would get us like the unicorn consultant that could do all these different things. <laughs> and um, talking to potential or not talking to people that are in uh, these fields, it seemed like it wasn't as possible. Um, and what I mean by that is I know that our, our neighbors uh, to, the, to the east, uh, Amherst, were able to work with a group to provide some uh, feedback about their Crest team, which I think is a great report. I read through it a couple of times already. Um, and I know their team is getting ready to, to actually hire too, and they have some of their um, leadership hired already. Um, I think our model is a little bit different than Crest. And so I wanted some consultants that had a different take on crisis response that were really considering peer led responses and power with and harm reduction responses. And so that's why I wanted those separate. Um, having dispatch data analysis to help us with, um, you know, using the already existing data for the scope and capacity, like what times of day or night are we getting the most calls through dispatch? Um, and that could help us figure out when we staff our initial uh, team, which might not be 24 seven, it's likely not going to be from the start. Um, but that doesn't really help us decide like what are the actual practices we're training our um, first responders to actually um, hold. Um, and I think we want to have a model that's um, reflecting those values of um, if not actually peer supporters, like coming from that value system of, of power with and harm reduction. And so that's why I've chosen to separate those. Um, so, and I have people in mind for both of these, so that, that this will be hopefully um, it, possible to fill. So 
Okay, I think I've been talking for a while, so I want to give it a pause. I just wanted to give you some context of what I've been up to, a general sketch of the visions. I know you you all had very specific questions too, but I wanted to um, yeah, pause for some of your questions and thoughts and I can respond to those too. So thanks. Well, thank you, Sean. And I will turn it over to any of the counselors who want to ask their questions. Counselor Jared. Um, thanks, Sean. Um, um, thanks, that was a great update. Um, I uh, had a question just to follow up with something you said um, that in terms of uh, giving, uh, paying, you know, giving people some stipends for public service. One of the things um, I looked into when I was on the housing partnership was looking in to see if there was a nonprofit that we could give grants for public service. So separate from the city to kind of get away from the, the issue that the city doesn't have a structure for that. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know if that is a possible, something that you've considered um, in, in the process yet. Yes, um, I appreciate you mentioning that. I, I have talked about that possibility with a couple, couple people recently. Um, and uh, and I, I definitely welcome any other uh, resources around that, Councilor Jarrett, if you want to send it my way. I know that um, I've talked to some people in the city who have used similar models in the past. Um, and some of that might be applicable to what we're trying to do with the Department of Community Care. Uh, but some of it is, is slightly different, like especially the timeline. <laughs> you know, I think we're I'm I'm sitting with like putting the brakes on to be like, no, we need to like build relationships before we can move forward. And other times we have we have the fiscal year, which doesn't wait for anyone, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm um, trying to like figure out how to balance those, um, where the urgency needs to continue to be urgent and where it doesn't. So um, that is all to say, like, I'd, I'd appreciate if you, um, if you thought to send me some, some more resources, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, I'll follow up about that. Um, so one of my questions was um, in your first, in the first year of operation, whenever that starts, and I, I don't know if you have an idea yet of when that, that might happen, but um, what kinds of calls do you see uh, the community care department responding to and, and what might that expand to in future years? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I'll just like be transparent. I have a little outline down here. That's why I might be looking down, I'm not trying to resist eye contact. <laughs> um, but I just wanna make sure I can cover the things that I wanted to. and. Um, yeah, so the first year, I, I imagine our first year will start kind of mid uh, fiscal year 23, the way things are working out. Um, this is this is rough, so don't, I mean, I was gonna say don't quote me on that, but this is probably recorded, so you can always come back to it. Um, but but what I'm gonna say provisionally, just, just as, a, as a possible guess is that, um, you know, we would get started halfway through, or a little bit earlier than halfway through fiscal year 23. And um, at that point, we would be um, starting on a smaller scale, honestly. Um, I think that given that we are trying to um, have a, uh, a team, at least at this point, that is, is non-clinical um, and, and of course non-law enforcement, and we're trying to carve out a specific niche for how we might have responses based on harm reduction and, and perhaps peer-led support, um, I wanna be very clear um, with protections around our, our, our team's integrity. So we don't have mission drift into like being um, law enforcement adjacent or risk assessment adjacent. I think that those are things that came up in the policing review commission's public hearings when I remember listening to them, which was like, it's not just about the police that sometimes are, are miss, um, you know, not really like the best fit for so many calls, but sometimes like there are other forms of um, detainment or or people uh, sensing their safety not being held around like um, involuntary detainments with section 12, section 35. I'm not saying those are always like um, the worst options, but I, but I wanna have a department where we can work on other ways of responding to people. And so um, that is all to say that, um, you know, we're, we might start a little smaller and figure out how to do some smaller um, call, a smaller range, I should say, of, of call types really well and then build up from there. And so what I will say is that um, 
this Friday, I have time set aside with Chief Casper and Kelly Schutze from Dispatch. Um, and we are going to be looking through a month's worth of representative dispatch data to really think about like, what are the percentage of calls, not just in theory that we could respond to as our team, but the three of us could agree are already existing in the, um, you know, sort of the records of dispatch. And so that's gonna be an important time for us to like also um, workshop the different ideas of safety we might have and like how they're aligned and how they're not. And just figuring out like even some initial um, dispatch protocol. So we're, we're having a workshop uh, time on Friday and I expect that our consultants will do a deeper dive you know, in the near future, but we really needed to start <laughs> with something. And so we're going to look at you know, calls that get coded as um, you know, mental health and substance use, possibly even like um, disputes that don't involve like violence. Um, we're gonna work that out on Friday with, with, with a somewhat, um, somewhat guidance. But the thing that I learned, and I forget, Councilor Jatter, if you were part of this um, committee and the Policing Review Commission, because you might've learned this too, is that sometimes the call types that are um, you know, labeled certain ways, like in the system of, of dispatch, um, I think it's called CAD, Computer Assisted Dispatch, like they have certain codes um, they don't always like align with what is actually happening on the ground. Um, and part of that is, isn't any nef anything nefarious. It's just like, um, if a caller says, you know, like, oh, there's like violence happening because there's someone yelling, like someone might respond to the call and it's actually someone like, um, for instance, like have hearing a voice and yelling back at it and there's no violence, you know, there. And so what might've been recorded as like possible assault and battery actually wasn't that at all. So we're gonna, we're gonna like dive into the dispatch data to really look at like what's actually happening in these situations. Um, and so I think that also just brings up a bigger issue is I, I think there was a more uniform um, interest in having this new community responder team addressing like uh, so-called mental health calls. Um, but even that, what does that mean, <laughs> right? Like even if it is sort of coded correctly in the call data, um, as I'm sure a lot of us know, but I can certainly attest to like what gets classified as mental, quote unquote mental health can have a whole range of different um, issues that come up. And so, and there's also some calls that get coded otherwise that actually have some sort of component of um, quote unquote mental health, uh, you know, uh, sort of a caring response that's related to mental health that could be most useful too. So, so that's why I'm, I'm kind of not talking around your question, but I'm just trying to say like we're we have some ideas of what we're looking for and what we respond to, but I think we have to like workshop and like almost play it out as if we have this new team. And, um, you know, Kelly and, and Chief Casper are gonna have different understandings uh, from their work of like, oh, this is how this could go to a different place that your team might not be able to handle, quote unquote. Um, but we're gonna try to figure out like, where, where is our overlap, you know, of what our calls will, will look like. Um, I will say that I've heard from our, my, I, I've also been to dispatch twice. I've been like in the call center for like half a day twice and I'm going again for an evening shift on Friday, this Friday too, from six to 10, hearing that um, that's the busiest time of week for dispatch. Um, so I just wanted to see what it was like. And um, dispatchers have been really gracious with their time. Like when they're not on calls, like having conversations with me about their role and what's hard and like what they could see be different and what, what I'm doing. Um, and so I'm hoping to learn more that day. Um, but I was gonna say that um, what I'm hearing from dispatch too is that sometimes they get a bunch of calls of, with people that are, are lonely too. And so if our team has some more time to respond to things that aren't as emergent, um, you know, we might respond to those things too, even though with the current first responder setup, like no one might maybe was dispatched because it doesn't fit into their wheelhouses. Um, and that's not uh, to say like, we're gonna take like all the, the light calls, like sometimes these uh, calls for which there's no clear first responder um, sometimes escalate over time when they're not responded to. Um, and so we are going to figure out like, there might be some things that have never made it into the call dispatch, the, the dispatch data rather, um, that we might respond to, not to mention um, all the calls of that people haven't made because they haven't felt like comfortable, like, with a potential police response, which is something that came up a lot in the policing review commission too. So we're exploring like dispatch diversion, like to our particular new team, but also like, would we have a separate number that people could get around dispatch altogether? So we're talking through the benefits and the pitfalls of that given our current system. Um, 
yeah. And I, um, I also know that uh, like talking to the uh, group in Olympia, Washington, um, their, their director, um, their, uh, their team, which is a little bit different than ours, but, but still similar, they didn't start out like taking calls directly. They started out like being in the community like downtown and Olympia. And that's something I imagine our team starting as to like, we're likely gonna have a van, um, something, you know, we can get to calls with, but also have a lot of supplies. So this is just my vision, <laughs> but I, I, I imagine like we could even have like a regular presence every night, uh, certain times like in a public parking lot or something where people could come to us and kind of just have like, um, you know, a safe zone or a, or a place to come and people could ask us questions and so, I imagine the buildup also will involve things like that before we're actively taking calls. I really think it's um, it's as much about shifting the top-down system, and once again, as it is about like building community trust and just like being reliable. And sometimes that could just be like, oh, we're out with a van every two hours, you know, Wednesdays and Thursdays. I'm not sure what that would look like, but but that's just a, an example. So like just making sure that um, yeah, we have relative community presence before we're just like responding to calls. Uh, I think it seems like a really important step too. Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks for that answer. Um, do we want to rotate questions? All right, I have you two can, more questions. You, you can add, con continue, Council Jerry. Okay, well, kind of a follow up to that um, is uh, how, what do you see the working relationship with the Northampton Police Department? Um, you know, we can think of different scenarios of response, the community care on its own, um, then would you have the police as backup in some scenarios, or would you be backup to, to the NPD, or would there be a co-response? What are, what are the different possibilities that you're, that you're thinking? Yeah, um, that's a great question, Councilor Jarrett. Uh, so as far as how we might entertain co-response versus, um, you know, situations that get more complicated. Um, first off, I want to say we do we do have at least one person who's a, who's a trained social worker, so different kind of discipline than I'm hoping our team to have, or maybe maybe they will have social work experience, but not the focus of our team to do assessments. Um, but CSO does have at least one clinical social worker who co-responds with the police right now, and I'm not looking to. Um, you know, try to echo that <laughs> at all. Um, and what I will, what I will say is, um, we're still working out like what it, what it might look like um, in in certain uh, calls. Like if if something kind of goes uh, a way that is 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 edging towards violence or or just like disruption. Um, but I also know like models like cahoots in the Eugene, Oregon. Um, though it is different than ours, like it's definitely founding, it's like sort of the foundation of why we're even doing this. Um, I think in 2019, uh, you know, they, they responded to 24,000 calls, I believe is what I wrote down and, and only 311 ever required police backup. Um, and so while we're not, like I said, um, just copying, pasting their model, we're taking a lot of uh, inspiration from them. Like even before I took this role, I know uh, the Policing Review Commission and other people were looking at cahoots. And so um, I wanna talk more with them and Eugene or um, Olympia's team and others to see like, how does this work <laughs> and, and get a better sense. Um, so I'm really hoping that we will, we will not have to involve the police much as well uh, because our, we'll have a really uh, intentional focus of what we're responding to and why. Um, I will say there are times when we're probably going to be on the scene together, like even if we don't get called out um, in a, in a co-response way. And so I want to be really clear about language here. Um, we are not um, setting up a co-response model. I know some, some cities have that more than just the one clinician we have in ours, like where social workers are embedded with the police and actually, uh, you know, go with them in cruisers. We have models like that throughout Massachusetts. Um, that's not the model that has been the mandate of our Department of Community Care, and that's not what I'm working with um, in developing this. So I just want to be really clear about that. Um, you know, I think part of what I'm thinking about when we think about how we're, we'll design how we respond, how dispatch diverts to us, is also carving out space in our, in our first response system for us to do our jobs well. Um, and to really make sure that we're not getting like forced to act like co-response to. And so that's something we're still negotiating. Um, 
but I wanted to give you an example just so it's not just like um, too theoretical. Uh, so one of the conversations I've been having with people a lot uh, from community organizations to our public safety team to people in Japan centers is about well-being checks. Um, and I don't know if all of you know what those are, but essentially um, family members or um, you know, service providers usually are the most likely people to submit these, um, you know, can make a request of law enforcement. Um, and sometimes uh, that's gone through the, our DART team uh, in, in different ways uh, for, for an officer to check up on a person they think is, um, you know, either not doing well or, or you know, they, they're, they're worried that someone's like drug use or alcohol use um, or struggles around suicidal thoughts, like has um, maybe impacted them in a harmful way. Uh, and so I'm still trying to understand the, you know, the regulations around this, like what's the, what's the threshold at which like we have to act as a, as a group or as a, even the police. Um, but essentially this has come up a lot in my uh, work as a facilitator of, of peer support groups where people um, felt trauma actually from having people um, instigate cops to come or police officers to come to their door because they were worried about them. And in fact, you know, that often escalated someone's distress. Um, I want to be real that in conversations with, with, our, with our police and other people, like sometimes um, wellness checks end up with someone who is found deceased, which is a reality too. And so like, there's a whole range of um, what these calls can look like just under one call type. And so um, that is one of the things I've been talking out with people and something we'll talk about on Friday, I, I, I'm sure is looking at like how many of those types of calls end up with someone not answering the door for whatever reason, because that would, I wanna understand more about if our team responded to that, what is our obligation under the current law? Um, and so while I see that there is a great um, institutional harm reduction, for lack of a better phrase, <laughs> In us, you know, being able to respond to well-being checks that are um, people that know what that's like in some ways and are not armed and maybe are not coming as um, as assessment to detain. Um, you know, I don't know if that would get us too wrapped up in a law enforcement framework uh, for us to like have um, sustained community trust. And so these are some of the questions that I'm that I'm asking. You know, is uh, th does the benefit outweigh the potential uh, mission drift uh, and um, you know, are there ways to shift um, what initiates or compels a well-being check and how it's performed that might better fit our team? Like how much uh, leeway do we have in the law to change that? And so these are theoretical questions, rhetorical questions, but if anyone has some thoughts about that, if you want to email me, <laughs> that's great too. Um, but this is one example of, I think people were like, oh, of course this team should take on well-being checks. But I think sometimes we have to think about like, um, it's not sometimes not just the um, the person to person response that needs to change, but it's like the regulations and this top down um, structure too. Because I don't want a, our team to kind of be um, you know just law enforcement light, <laughs> and so I want to be very clear about like what our boundaries are. Um, and so um, I think there's a lot of arguments to say we we could take on, for instance, just this one example, well-being checks, and it will be a great service to our community to like not have people who are already in distress like answer the door to people with guns, to be really frank. Um, but I also want to make sure that we're clear, like if it does go a different direction and someone being able to answer the door, whether they're angry about it or not, <laughs> um, like what's the next step? So that's something that I hope Chief Casper and Kelly and I will will really be able to focus on Friday and beyond that. Um, yeah, so I guess I also just want to acknowledge one more thing, which I think is something that every community is dealing with who's thinking about community response teams. And that's like some of our most high profile, um, you know, deaths or killings that have involved um, law enforcement, you know, each context is different, of course, right? Um, they've involved these calls that our team probably wouldn't be sent out on alone. And that is something I'm aware of, like how are there, is there any potential for us to do a call response that would be, that would serve our community? Like, I don't know. <laughs> like in, in terms of like, if someone is, um, I'll just name a really, really raw one, like um, Orlando Taylor III, who was, who was shot by, um, not in our city, but south of here, Springfield law enforcement. Um, 
I just, I wonder, I wonder if there was um, a different uh, response to, to what that man was going through, if it would have ended up the same way. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not trying to pass judgment on the police on, on anything in Springfield that I don't know about more directly, but but I just know that the way that was classified, even in like the dispatch data, like we wouldn't have been, um, our team wouldn't have been um, dispatched to that because it would have been considered violent, but, but was the violence actually there <laughs> until like we brought armed officers there? And, and I just don't know. Um, what I will say, I attended the, um, the memorial with his family and community members, and it's definitely left a big, a big scar in that community. And so, um, I would love to figure out how to um, avoid, you know, more um, more instances like that. But I also want to make sure that our new team in Northampton, not Springfield, um, is really able to do its job well, especially the first year. <laughs> I'm going to be really honest. Like this is something we're trying that's new. Um, it's it's pulling off a lot of wisdom and a lot of experience that we have in our communities that are, that's already there. Um, but the way we're pulling it together uh, is, is definitely, definitely new. And so I want to make sure that um, in the words of a friend of mine who I was speaking with last week, you know, if we have to be just like an, an inch wide and a mile deep as far as like what we're going to do well, um, that's fine by me. <laughs> and, and so I don't, I also want to make sure that our responders, um, you know, given that we're creating this from the ground up, like are not being pushed into situations that they're not prepared for. Um, especially if people are themselves holding trauma as people with lived experience. And so I think there's also just a bigger question of like, if we had the chance to start this department from the ground up, can we learn from some of the ways that other first responders are, are sort of, um, you know, not able to recover from horrible things they witness, for instance, or are there ways that our, our team can um, be more proactive about like, um, as we talked about at MANA today, like, debriefing after something happens rather than just like letting it fester. Um, and, and that does two things. It doesn't allow for people to be sustainably employed in these jobs, but oftentimes when people are getting vicarious trauma on the job, um, it also passes on to people they're responding to who aren't being cared for the way they should either. And so these are some things I'm also trying to think about. Like if we start small, that's the other reason, um, making sure that we can have a sustainable team. Um, yeah, so this started with your question, <laughs> Councillor Jared, about co-response, but that's, I hope that gives a picture of, um, you know, at least where I'm thinking, based on the many conversations I've had, uh, where that lands right now and, and wh what's still unfolding, but I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions too. Yeah, uh, thank you, Director. I really uh, think, I really hear that you're embodying the spirit of the, the Policing Review Commission's recommendations and and being so thoughtful about the steps that we're going to take. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, and yeah, I, I I think that's you know that that we're not devising a co-response situation seems seems entirely right. Um, though the question of whether you might be on the scene at the same time is is an interesting one, and I'm sure you'll. Uh, uh, figure that out as it comes to reality. Um, my last question was to, if you could describe as far as you know so far, what the hiring and the training process for the new responders will be. Yeah, um, a lot of that is in flux too. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, but I can I can speak to what I do know. Um, I, uh, I know that we we are looking to, you know, learn from other models like even Amherst, you know, which is a, I don't want to say that they're they're ahead of us in some ways, but they're because they're on a different trajectory. But they are about to, um, as far as I understand, you know, like have uh, responders start responding this summer, I believe, if not sooner. Um, I'm actually meeting with the um, the program director Earl Miller tomorrow, um, or at least as long as he has time. <laughs> I know he's just starting this week, so I'm glad that we're going to have some time to to talk. Um, yeah, and so, uh, but. And so I want to learn a little bit what they're doing for hiring. So we're more on the same page. I have a lot of ideas already. Um, but what essentially what I want is to make sure that people can be competent crisis navigators, um, um, you know, not necessarily having all the training already. Uh, if I'm going to be really honest, I think sometimes what I'm more concerned about is um, 
not having people with the right credentials. I think, you know, Amherst is thinking about that too, like not necessarily saying we need to hire people with advanced uh, mental health degrees, um, but we need to think about hiring the best people. Um, so some of the things I've also learned in my like 12 years in the mental health system or as an advocate um, with, without and within um, is that there are a lot of people that go to social work school and they don't know how to be in a crisis situation at all. <laughs> like there's plenty of education you can have, but you haven't, if you haven't been in it and you're practicing a certain way, like you just, you don't have the relevant experience. And so what I'm more interested in is um, how people can have like the experiences they need to, to build upon in these roles and the training that I want to offer the team rather than something we have to undo. Um, so there's a lot of people that are, um, you know, licensed clinical social workers that are amazing in, in crisis situations because they put themselves out there, they've learned, they've adapted. Um, but I would, I would guarantee that they didn't learn that in their grad programs. <laughs> um, and so when people kind of say, we need MSWs to do this work, like I'm just curious what people mean by that. And so I'm not opposed to having people with those degrees, but that wouldn't be the reason they'd be hired for this team, at least at this point. And so what I'm thinking also is that, you know, we've put a lot of money into retooling and retraining uh, our law enforcement to undo a lot of the training that they've learned. Um, and so we've already decided we're not, that's not what we're doing at this point. We wanted to start a new department to address some of these things rather than having more police officers go through crisis intervention training, for instance, and that whole um, ecosystem of trainings. And I'm not saying uh, it can't be a valid use of our, our money perhaps, but, I just think we've realized like we need to try something different. Um, and so I'm also thinking about like what, what other trainings people have that are gonna be hindrances to them stepping into these um, gray areas that we're gonna be responding to. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really looking for people that have demonstrated whether they have um, uh, a degree of higher learning or not that, that they are um, capable um, crisis navigators. And then I wanna, make sure that we're giving them even more skills to work with. And so um, I don't want to name any organizations that we might work with because I haven't uh, clarified that, though I have a lot in mind. Uh, but I want to make sure that our team, um, you know, is, I don't know, getting some training in uh, like connection and really difficult moments with situational awareness, um, being able to practice like power with principles whenever possible, which means that like there's active consent happening as much as possible. And like, I'm curious what that will look like in these situations. Uh, but that would look like, you know, learning about different ways to respond to someone that's like angry or hearing voices or being su or suicidal. Um, like there are different skill sets that are useful in those. Um, and also I'm, I'm curious uh, how people can, you know, be trained in um, conflict resolution and engagement. Uh, but as I've talked to various stakeholders in our community, specifically related to domestic violence, I had some great uh, pushback by people saying, well, not every situation can be resolved because not every situation is a mutual, it's a conflict of equal power. Like there's also abuse um, situations. And so I'm actually attending a training next week that um, we'll, might, we'll get at that. So I, I want to make sure that while we have our, um, first responders like trained in conflict engagement, also trained to discern if that's even a useful thing <laughs> in the moment. Uh, and so that's something I'm still thinking through about like, if not, like, do we be interrupters? What does that even look like? I don't have a fully fleshed out idea of that, but I do know that um, discerning between a situation that is involving conflict that we can kind of mediate in the spot versus one that's actually having power dynamics that we need not we engage that way is important. And so I'm actually taking a training um, called, uh, what is it called? Compassionate Accountable Conversation Skills, which um, is being offered by BSAS. Um, and so I, I'm interested if that could be a useful training for our, for our first responders. Um, and also, you know, just looking to get more harm reduction skills um, into the hands of our, of our first responders. So we're aware of how to support people um, first of all, like knowing how to use Narcan. <laughs> I think a lot of us know, but just like making sure that's folded into uh, being available for our team, but also not just the practice of um, helping someone revive from an opiate overdo overdose, uh, but also like how do you care for someone in those moments? That's not coming from the standpoint of um, law enforcement or even paramedic, like we're, we're a different niche. 
And so those are some things I'm hoping will be trained in. And then, you know, we're probably going to need some training about um, laws and regulations, um, as well as like the role of other first responders, like, and we might have to do some cross training about like, what are our roles? <laughs> So that our other first responders know who we are and what our roles are, um, in addition to learning our dispatch and data management systems. Uh, and those are things I'm talking about with uh, people that oversee dispatch and our public health department, like seeing if any data management tools that they already are using could be useful for our department where we can create um, you know, privacy barriers. Um, I don't think we need to take extensive data on people. That's not what I'm interested in at all. But what I am interested in is like, can we um, identify where the gaps still exist in our community? Uh, so for instance, um, people have said, you know, like, I love this new idea that for this team, but you're not gonna provide people with the supported housing you need. It's not a 24 seven space for people to go when they need it. It's not uh, a hygiene facility that's 24 seven, like all things we need. I know we need this, but sometimes um, showing in the data where the gaps are could help us attain this. And so that's something I'm thinking of as well and talking with um, the director of public health and other people about like, how can we craft data management systems that, um, you know, are not, not taking unnecessary information about people, but are getting like a deeper picture of how we're being effective, but also what we need still in the city and in Western Massachusetts in general. So, um, so learning about what those systems are, I think we're gonna need some technical training as well for our, our first responders, our community responders. Um, yeah, and I'm also uh, hoping that we'll have consultants that will help us offer some knowledge about how they've developed that in their own communities and comparative knowledge about how they've supported other uh, communities to, to be uh, hired and trained. And so there's a lot that um, I'm still looking to answer, but that's like the skeleton of what um, what I'm thinking through right now. Great. Well, thank you so much for your very thorough answers and um, yeah. let other counselors. Oh, I did want to say I have had some contact with folks at Crest, um, had some conversations with Russ Vernon Jones, who's on the implementation team. And uh, he, he said he would, he would love to talk with you. So if, if I'd be happy to connect you if you haven't already. That would be great. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's funny. I feel like I'm I'm connected to well to a lot of people, but sometimes I just miss some other folks. And like I, I know folks, some folks involved with the town of Amherst process. But that would be great to have more connections to to that group. So thanks so much, Councilor Jarrett. Yeah, thank you, Director. Thanks, Council Mayor. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Director Donovan, for being here, and um, I've. I've kind of stopped in a few times and you've been very responsive and I appreciate it. I love seeing your structure you created because I mean, doing something new is just so hard. You know, it's not even about uh, partisan, you know, political, being political. It's just creating something is so difficult. I feel overwhelmed for you. And it's, I really appreciate how you're really holding tight to your mission uh, because it could be, to me, it'd be very easy to just go, especially to go with well-worn paths, you know, even with these alternatives. So I, I really, I feel really grateful for that. Um, yeah, I guess I just, my only, my two questions were, you know, a, a general, like immediate, um, my bigger concern, immediate concern is just like, you know, are you getting the support you need? And, and if, if you, if and when you don't feel like that, um, you know, I hope that you'll engage people because it is new um, and we, People don't all know, you know, they, we don't all know what you're up against. And and uh, so, you know, interested in if you're feeling like you have the resources and um, I'm, I might, I, I'm sure I'll reach out when the budget is, you know, comes out and really make sure um, you can launch this when you're ready. Uh, and so, yeah, about support. And then I guess um, from what I've read of other models, you know, it's so much about this the training of the dis dispatchers, you know, because if you don't, if you, that's such an, you know, a skill to be able to put the right call. And especially if you've been doing something one way for so long. Um, so I, I guess um, I'm hoping that you'll, you know, you'll be involved in the, the assessment tools that are created around that and in the choosing of the, the trainings for these dispatchers, because to me, that will make all the difference if we land these, call, these calls skillfully in the right hands. 
Yeah, thank you, Councilor Mayori. That's that's a great point. Um, I know that this is something I'm still talking out with our public safety and public health team, like in the city. Um, but I know that uh, Kelly Schutze and I have been in a lot of connection, but we've been in touch pretty often since I started this role. And that's something we're interested to make sure that like her, her team of dispatchers has like the right tools that they need that will actually make best use of our new department and our new community responder team. So yeah, I'm not quite sure what those are going to look like yet because we're still developing them. But um, I know from talking to groups, like um, a lot of them are in the Pacific Northwest for some reason, but like Portland Street Response is another group that started in the last year and they've developed some really great um, decision, decision trees <laughs> you know, like that can just really help um, dispatch make quick decisions because they have to. Um, I think the rule of thumb is that like, I'm not sure if this is Northampton based or national based, but just like dispatchers are supposed to make a decision about the, um, the direction of the call within 20 seconds. And so that's like not a lot of time when you're trying to like, I might be wrong about this, but essentially it's like not a lot of time <laughs> to make a decision. And, and so what Kelly and I have talked about is that, and maybe this is another part of the vision just to uh, explore this more, is that we would have our own center with call takers. So our, our first responders would be cross-trained as um, community responders and call takers, um, knowing that you know dispatch has to make these quick decisions, but sometimes I imagine we would be able to resolve some calls just on the phone. Um, and that would like free up our resources to do other things. And so I have some colleagues that help run uh, crisis lines that are both like clinical and peer. And so I've been talking with them as well about how did they set this up? What are the um, things that they're putting in place for how calls happen? And so while our, our, we're not we're not focusing solely on a call center, but I think that's a big piece of it. Yeah, like how can we um, have dispatch diversion to our center um, You know, when, when we have calls through dispatch? Um, yeah, that is making uh, good use of, of our team um, and I think part of that is not just having good training and tools for dispatch, but but some mutual trust too. And so we've talked about doing some trainings together as well. So like, what what could that look like? So we're not nothing is set in stone, but we're we're exploring what other um, communities have done to some success. So yeah, it's a great question. Um, the other piece about support, uh, I do feel like there's a pretty wide interest in the city. Um, for this department to be successful. And I'm really glad for that. <laughs> um, when I said it's been hard to start a public health adjacent um, department, that was by no means suggesting that um, people are not invested in this. Um, I think we're, we're just juggling a lot <laughs> in our community like most. And so I do feel like there's, there's support. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to mention to, to city councilors especially is that when I mentioned this like third piece of what I would hope this department will be is around like public education. That's something I think the counselors could be really helpful with. Um, someone I talked to that's more of a community organizer that's given me some like space to be a thought partner through a lot of this uh, implementation work has really like redirected me to some of my instincts as a community organizer to be like, sometimes it just happens to, it has to happen on a neighborhood to neighborhood level. That's how change happens. And so the fact that each of you is responding to specific words, like a collection of neighborhoods, I think could be really um, useful for how we might continue to engage our communities. And I'm not saying I have like a specific agenda for that, um, but I do think there's a value in, um, you know, knowing that each of you sort of is a, uh, a representative for different parts of the city. And so I, I have you all in mind as far as like, you know, how could we um, work together on some of these these pieces that really get at, um, yeah, like giving more, more skills and even like permission to our community members to be in some conversations that are needed beyond first response. Um, so like one quick example I'll give, if you've ever like, heard a podcast, a radio show, a TV show, read a newspaper article that mentions suicide at all, you probably without fail see like um, the National uh, Suicide Lifeline printed these days. I don't know if you've noticed that in your browsings. Um, I think that's great in the sense that like we're not ignoring that there's support there, um, but I don't think it's enough. <laughs> You know, uh, I think sometimes it sends the message that we shouldn't be talking to each other. Like we should wait till we give someone a number or get them to a professional. Um, but oftentimes we have the skills in our relationships already. 
um, if, if we have trust and if we have the ability to like give some time. And so that's just one example where I could see like, um, you know, having more, I don't know, like literacy in our community, not, not in terms of, you know, uh, traditional literacy, but like emotional and, and connection literacy. Um, like we don't need to just like say, oh, can't talk to you about that. You, here's the here's the number. <laughs> like that could be useful sometimes when we don't have the relationship with people. And like when we're publishing things in the New York Times or whatever, it's going out to a wide audience. But given that we are our own like community locally, like we might be able to give people some skills to engage in those conversations. Um, and I think sometimes it comes down to like not only skills, but to have permission to do that. Um, and so that's just one example that I know really well because of my past work, but I know that there, there are other examples of, um, you know, how we might be able to engage uh, our communities on a more neighborhood level. Um, and so I'm not quite sure what, like I said, what that might look like in practice, but it's something I want to make space for. Yeah. Can I do a follow up? Uh, uh, Councillor Perry, thanks. Oh, well, I will just say that, you know, as a Ward 7 counselor, one thing that I've been wanting for my ward is, um, and we're working on it, um, is so we talked about having a ranger um, or some sort of liaison at the swimming holes to prevent, um, you know, as an alternative to calling police on um, outsiders who come to, you know, from outside the city to swim in our swimming holes. Um, and to have them be culturally informed and all that. That might, that's stretching it, that's not probably the first, um, your, your first, um, you know, mission here, because that's kind of like, um, you know, that's a different, a little bit of a, definitely some mission drift, but even if we had a ranger, or, I mean, it would be great if they were in contact with your department and, you know, in the future, I think that would be uh, a use of, um, you know, a use, I'd like to see like some mediation kind of skills or something, and maybe that's something to kind of um, mark for the future for you all. Um, so <clears throat> I can definitely see how it could be specific to neighborhoods. And I just wanted to also say that, you know, I was really um, I'm kind of inspired by what you were saying, you know, already thinking about, you know, the kind of sustainability mental health of your, of your team. And when we visited and we did the tour of the, dis of the dispatch, um, you know, Kelly really shared with us the kind of trauma of working there. And it just made me want, you know, I've been thinking ever since about, is there some even small things we can do to make brighter days over there? And perhaps that could be a joint effort for anyone dealing with that, you know, non-police folks like um, your team and dispatch. Uh, because my first thought, if I were on dispatch as a hypervigilance, I would just, it would be really hard for me to switch gears, you know, and be like, oh, don't call the police, like go here. You know, because it's such a you know intense thing. So I, I think I'm just really glad that you're working with Kelly like that. And I would like to, if you think of a way, you know, while while you're working with Kelly, you know, just some sort of way that we can, um, you know, maybe the briefing, the culture of the briefing or something. Because I was interested in that after our visit with this patch. But uh, thanks, Director. Yeah, thanks for saying that, <laughs> Councilor Mayori. And yeah, I think it's. I think it's the last two years has amplified a lot of a lot of the stress on first responders, but it's always been there. Um, and I think, in addition to just the needing to respond to, um, you know, heighten uh, despair, distress, and, and and contagion in the in the pandemic. Um, you know, there's just less people working, and I'm not making a judgment about people who are working and not working. It's just a, just the thing. I think all of us are sitting with now, um, you know, I'm sitting with that possibility as someone who's trying to hire, you know, a handful of people or more, you know, in the next year, or is anyone going to want to work uh, in this job? Not because it's it's not great work and hopefully it will be well paid too. Uh, it just seems like we've had, we're also in a, a pretty big like uh, culture shift around work right now. And so I do think, um, you know, I, I think some of our some of the work that I want to do around public and community education is also about the the stress of of um, people on the front lines and how that you know that leads to non sustainable jobs, but it also leads to trickle down lack of care. Not because people don't want to be caring, but like 
when people are stressed out and forced to work overtime and doesn't usually translate to like people having like patience, compassion, curiosity, you know, for the people they're supporting as someone who's been an advocate in, um, you know, lock psychiatric wards for 10 years. Um, I've seen what happens when um, mental health counselors, for instance, like the lowest rung of the ladder in institutional settings are forced to work overtime. The amount of restraint and seclusion that happens as a result um, is significant. <laughs> And, and sometimes I guess like what I'm trying to say is like, I'm, I think I, I'm curious in what ways our department, given that we are being created as a whole new department, not just like a community responder team, you know, can play a role in like um, highlighting some of these things. And I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I know it's a, it's an issue for paramedics, um, you know, especially for social workers, um, you know, people who, whose jobs are on the front line, but are specifically like, um, really, really spread thin right now, like people working in hospitals, et cetera. Um, and so, yeah, it just, it's on my mind a lot <laughs> as someone who's also worked in a peer led organization for about 10 years. Um, I also know that my, uh, my supervisor and people I worked alongside with, like we've all made a lot of very collective accommodations to keep each other alive and to keep each other employed. <laughs> And so I'm curious what ways that translate in, into the city government and what ways it does not. Um, I'm gonna be really transparent, but like I've, I'm trying to be in touch with our um, HR people about like, what are the, what is the realm of accommodations we can offer to people and still like have them in a position. We also have the obligations as first responders of showing up, you know, which isn't just like, not, not to say the other jobs are any less important, but just like this feels important to have people showing up. <laughs> to their jobs, but like, we also know that for hiring people with lived experience, sometimes past trauma becomes present, um, which doesn't mean that they're not excellent first responders. They actually have that extra um, resource, which I guess I haven't named yet, of like um, knowing what it's like to be in similar positions as the people we're responding to. And that is um, an unmatched resource. Um, so for me, as someone who has been institutionalized in my past and who has dealt with suicidal thoughts for a lot of my life, like, I don't necessarily know, um, you know, like the answer for people <laughs> to like resist institutionalization or to stay alive, but I have a much better context for knowing the right type of questions to ask and the right type of space to hold with people, which might also just be silence, you know? And so I have some faith that, um, you know, for hiring people that have been through it, this is what they're bringing, you know, which is unique. Um, and so we have some ways we can um, honor that both in terms of the practices, but I hope in terms of how we don't burn people out, but that's that's a tall order to figure out. And I'm, I'm trying to ask for support from other people around how to do that. Um, one last thing I just wanted to say, sorry, uh, Councillor Perry. Um, with regards to the river stewards <laughs> piece, I will say someone else in the city brought that up with me. And while I'm not sure what that looks like for the beginning of our department, um, it was a really helpful thing to think about, like how does our team have a presence in the community that doesn't mimic uh, walking a beat like a police officer. And so like the idea of like, what does it mean to be a steward, you know, in our community has been really helpful. So um, I, I imagine most of our, uh, you know, being in public might be more downtown, um, though I know that there's a lot of um, places uh, that first responders often respond to that are not downtown um, for various reasons. And so wanting to have a presence in those communities, but not um, in a way that mimics surveillance, I guess. Um, just trying to have an understanding of what that could look like. Still thinking that over, but it was helpful to hear from, from you, Council Mayor, and other people about like River stewards, <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I don't know if that fits into our mission, but it's a really, it's a helpful frame to think about like how our first responders might uh, play a different role in community. So thank you for that. Um, before I say anything, I, I wanna see if, if Laura or any of our other counselors wanted to ask any questions. I see that, you know, we do have Councilor LaBarge and Councilor Nash here. If you guys have any questions, no, no, all right. Uh, well, that being said, I first, Director Donovan, I wanna thank you for coming and sitting with us and chatting. Uh, I know that you have been working hard. This is a Herculean task of, like you said, creating something out of nothing. Um, 
one thing that really struck me, and, and I, I think a lot of the questions that I had were already asked by Council Jarrett and, and uh, Council Mayori, and, or you answered yourself. But one thing that really stood out to me is uh, how impressive it is that you are taking uh, a step back and looking at things from a bigger picture view. Um, I too like to look at things as, you know, how, how does it fit inside of our community and our city? Um, and I, I really enjoy that you are, you know, talking about education and a cultural shift. Um, you know, I think that understanding that this isn't a process that you're gonna to just come up with overnight is very important. Um, and I also wanna say that I personally, I, when I approach things, I look at what, the, what my skill set is and what I can bring to the table. And so uh, kind of mirroring off of Councilor Maori's question is that uh, I would offer my assistance uh, to you as well with my skill set. And I know that, um, you know, years of running Bishop's Lounge, for instance, and, or being in the nightclub scene, uh, I know what it's like to have uh, people in our community who are just coming to look for, whether it's a bathroom or a warm place. Um, and so, you know, I think that maybe reaching out, and I could do this as well, reaching out to some of our local restaurants and establishments of, you know, having literature and places to turn people um, when they do need help is going to go a long way um, to these things. And I, I also would like to say that, uh, you know, when you talk about driving the van around, uh, my, my mind immediately snapped back to a number of years ago with uh, this, this hip hop group, Mass Pike, who was around, they had the Buku Rants Records van, going around and I you know I, I just imagine you guys coming with you know the Department of Community Care and like oh yeah like seeing it in the neighborhood would just bring such joy so um, you know and I, I also thought about what it would be like to have kind of a kickoff event for the department um, you know I also see you guys having a, a large presence in our downtown area um, and I know that a, a number of the houses community are very uh, in, in our community at large are very artistic uh, there's a, and so you know the, the thought of maybe even putting together something in, in Pulaski Park or some some sort of event is something I would love to be a part of um, you know if you would if you would have me um, and also want to say I'm glad to hear that you are meeting up with Earl Miller who is the director of Crest he is a good friend of mine uh, before we started this meeting I was just talking to Laura about that and I wanted to bring you two together so uh, you know I, I'd love to get together with you both because I, I think that, um, you know, coming back to the, the big picture view as I see these issues, not just a Northampton problem or an issue, is that the, this is our greater community, whether it's Holyoke, whether it's East Hampton, whether it's Amherst. And so I would really like to do more of this uh, collaboration with different departments in different areas. So whatever I can do to help you, I wanna offer my assistance. And uh, I know other counselors have come to visit you. I've been trying to give you some space, but. I will come knocking sometime soon, um, whether it's just talking in the office or I, I am really interested in hitting the streets. Um, you know, I, I, I love meeting people in our community as the Ward 4 counselor. A lot of my ward is the downtown area. It's a lot of what is hit hard. Um, you know, I, I, I've watched as the police get called for things uh, in front of my, my establishment and other places where I'm like, oh, this, you know, this could be handled in a different manner. So whatever I can do to help you, I just want to offer that. Uh, and I want to tell you that the, the metric that you have of people who have lived experiences around, around here, I call that street cred, you know, yeah. you've done it before. So, uh, it doesn't have to officially be called that, but, uh, I wholly support people having that cred, uh, being in this department. Thank you so much, Councillor Perry. And I, uh, yeah, I would love to take you up on connecting around, um, you know, nightclubs, bars, businesses, especially like that connection. Uh, it's definitely something on my mind as well. Um, I used to work downtown for six years, not in a um, bar, but at Turn It Up Records and Raven Books, uh, especially Turn It Up Records. I feel like a lot of, you know, different things happen there <laughs> where I wish more of my employees were trained <laughs> to respond, you know, to some things that were kind of uh, shocking <laughs> yeah. uh, or varied. Um, and yeah, I think that's a big part of like this mission too. And, and certainly these uh, resource guides, I know that was the intention when the city first made these little resource uh, uh, cards in, in a sense was that businesses could have them and uh, people would just have like some more resources to share rather than having nothing. And so I'm hoping 
we can start to distribute those again, um, these new versions. So love to connect with you about that too. And um, yeah, I will say uh, the other thing that I've talked to people about, actually the town of Amherst and just like all over Northampton is um, part of community safety is like having more um, presence in community that people can, can be a part of or like, uh, like voices and celebrations that are often marginalized too. Um, and so, yeah, I love the idea of a kickoff event. <laughs> I actually played some mandolin outside before this meeting, which is grounding. <laughs> but um, yeah, a large part of how I connect with people in the world is through music. So um, yeah, which is actually not an aside for this work. I found that, um, you know, even just talking to people on the street about like, what kind of music would you want to hear on the sidewalk if you had your chance <laughs> to like uh, hear it? And I was telling people I play guitar. So some people are making some requests and learning some songs that people wanted to hear. Um, yeah, so I already have some of the workings of an event, maybe. <laughs> um, and just knowing that, yeah, a lot of like, I think the culture shift that I also envision for our city is um, sharing space together, sharing food, sharing the way that uh, we create beauty and meaning and art, like, and, and that can sound very, um, I don't know, woo-woo, but I think it's a huge part of how we even, as a neighbor, think about like, why I would want to care for a neighbor rather than like, um, you know, be afraid of them, for instance. And so, and I think that has some like racial equity issues too, about like, how do we make space for, um, you know, like just the other day, I was part of the um, flag raising, uh, Tibetan flag raising, um, just one example uh, of like making space for the Tibetan National Uprising Day and just like took up space downtown that's not there usually and is important to kind of have that residue of, um, you know, this is, this is an important thing we hold and so I know that there are other events that have raised um, the importance of um, issues around racial justice this past few years, et cetera, that I would love to continue into um, like music and art forms too that continue that as well. So um, yeah, I don't, I know I'm not the department of like, yeah, street cred and art, uh, but, or whatever, but I think it like, I think it's all related in a lot of sense. Um, so, you know, if people feel like, uh, honestly, for me, as an advocate and supporter of people that have been through like inconceivable trauma and like suicidal thoughts, like sometimes the best thing we could talk about was like what art's getting us through, what poem, what music. Um, I think when I've been to the drop-in centers even recently, connecting over um, music and culture is really important. Um, so when I say culture shift, I also mean like talking about culture, <laughs> you know, right? Like who we are, where we come from, why we're here. Um, those, those are things that are a little bit um, broader than the Department of Community Care, but I think it all can play a role um, in how we're, um, you know, shifting how we hold space in the city. Um, and so, yeah, really, really curious to, uh, yeah, brainstorm more <laughs> about those. I'm, I'm, not, I'm just running my mouth now, but like, but yeah, I appreciate you bringing in those elements, Councilor Perry. No problem. Th and, and thank you. you. You can keep running your mouth forever. I think this is very <laughs> educational for everyone. Uh, and I, I also would be remiss if I didn't add that Earl Miller is also a phenomenal MC uh, as well. So, uh, you know, I got a nod my hat when we first met, it was through the music community. And I think that, you know, people like yourself and Earl, um, you know, there, there is a through line of, of arts and, and communication and uh, helping one's community. So you know, I look forward to doing it. Maybe we'll even get uh, Councilor Jarrett to play a little something at a kickoff event. Um, yeah, I think it's also really important just to see um, people, I don't know, beyond like the first impressions, the roles, like how are we human? you know, in these various ways. Um, how are people more than just a trauma survivor or a city counselor, whatever, whatever it is. And yeah. so, um, yeah, and I also think it's taking a lot. Of, I think I'm, I'm pulling in a lot of my artistic inclinations into this role because we're creating something new, right? So we're not trying to just go with the same script. Um, we're actually trying to like flip it, you know, and also figure out like, how are we, um, you know, finding the creative middle path or whatever it is, like through things that we didn't think we could move through. Um, so I think it is all related to that. Um, and I'm also trying to get, um, you know, some real clear, um, you know, administrative, <laughs> you know, operational um, documents together so that we'll have a clear view for this department moving forward, but also, 
me quite honestly, like um, I'm not trying to get ahead of myself, but like what are what we're trying to do here, talking about it with people in other parts of the country, they're like, this is unique. And so we might become a model for other people. And so I'm, I'm keeping that in mind as um, I'm moving along to document the steps that I'm taking. Um, and I'm hoping I'll have some more materials to share with the city council and, and just the public at large about the visions for this department so that, um, yeah, I don't want this to feel like a secretive process, but I don't want to also release things too early that don't feel like they're going to um, give an accurate depiction of where we're headed. So I just want to be mindful of that too. Um, so yeah, hoping to have more of that together even in the next couple months, if not sooner. Yeah. Well, Director Donovan, thank you. Seriously, thank you uh, for giving us your time and for your commitment to the city. Thanks so much. Yeah, and once again, if you have any more uh, follow-up questions, you can feel free to email me. Um, yeah, and I'm, thanks for uh, thanks for the questions and for your attention and your time and your work as well. Thank you so much. Oh, it's hard to remember we're actually in a meeting. That was so captivating. Yeah, yeah I know. It's completely <laughs> riveting. Just really quick. Um, is this my cue to depart? <laughs> just yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can, you, you can leave the office. Okay. No, we're just kidding. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yeah, I will talk to Bye, you all soon. You. Thank you. Uh, let's see. With that, our the next item uh, is item seven, and that is to set a date for a community forum on prohibiting brokers' commissions from being charged to tenants. Right there was floated the idea of having um, the next community resource meeting, April 25th, or, or to be April 25th to discuss this. Uh, are there any, is there any discussion about whether that date works or what's the protocol for that? Um. Councilor Jared. Uh, yeah, that date works for me. Um, you know, we've sort of outlined a timeline of that would mean that um, it would then be go to legislative matters. If we were done with it after one meeting, we don't have to be. Uh, legislative matters on May 9th and then could be at council on May 19th. Um, so that, that timeline uh, works for me. I think that'll give us plenty of time to get the word out and get a lot of the stakeholders there. That was my concern too, sorry. Oh, no, yeah, I'm just gonna check in with my co-sponsor on that to make sure that the timeline works in terms of the other stops it has to make. <laughs> but it sounds like it does. And I also reached out to Councillor Elkins and she is available and thinks that that date would work for her as well. So with that being said, do we, I'm, I'm gonna, defer to Councilor Jared. Do we need to vote on that or do we just, or, or Laura? I think we just need to decide on a time. You know, I know there's quite a bit of community interest that I was contacted by the State Realtor Association, the Realtor Association of Pioneer Valley and our own local real estate representatives. So I know, you know, just that there's a lot of interest and it, it's good that we're having some lead time to publicize it a little bit. But yeah, I was just wondering what time because for any kind of or a flyer, we'd need that. Okay. Yeah. The For me, the 5.30 time works. I don't know if that works for everyone else. Yeah, yeah, I, I, think, that, I think that sounds like we should put it down. Right. Perfect. That was pretty painless. Thanks guys. <laughs> um, and that would bring us to new business. Does anyone have any new business to bring? I don't. So then that uh, brings us to our last big item, which is item nine. We need a motion. Move to adjourn. I will second that if I can. <laughs> I seconded it with my mic on. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Second. Second or third. All right, Laura. If you'd... Okay. Yeah. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Yes. Get it. Thanks, guys.